Greetings to all students, teachers, parents, and interested members of the public right across the Caribbean who have joined us this morning for our ninth in the series of schools history lectures on the topic movements towards independence across the Caribbean. My name is Professor Vereen Shepard and I will be your moderator this morning. I want to send a special welcome to the chair of the St. Lucia National Reparation Committee, Mr. Earl Busque, and members of all the collaborating entities on this lecture series. I want to say hello to a visiting research fellow in the Center for Reparation Research, Dr. Sandra Gift, the technical team at the Open Campus, the planning committee, and the communication and public relations team. Greetings to our distinguished speakers, our lecturers this morning, Mr. Omar, Mr. Malcolm, and Mr. Zundar. I will introduce them a little bit uh, later. And, uh, uh, and actually this morning, I want to do something differently. I want to ask them to tell you what you should know about them. At least two CARICOM countries, Jamaica and Trinidad and Tobago, will mark the 60th anniversary of the achievement of political independence next year. So this is a, as good a time as any to review the road to independence and to ask tough questions about what we have done with that independence. Have promises been fulfilled? Have promises been squandered? How much more do we have to do to actualize true independence? But before we get into the panel discussion for today, let me introduce you to Mr. Earl Busquet, who will give the official welcome. Journalist Earl Busquet is the current chair of the St. Lucia National Committee for Reparations and an active member of the CARICOM Reparations Commission. An activist and journalist, he has over the decades of ongoing experience, experience in newspaper, radio, and television in St. Lucia, Grenada, and Guyana. A recipient of the St. Lucia National Medal of Honor, gold, no less, for his contribution to journalism, Mr. Busquet is a former press secretary to Prime Minister Dr. Kenny D. Anthony. He's a founding member of the Workers' Revolutionary Movement in St. Lucia and therefore was intimately connected to the period of progressive left and politics, activism, and Marxist movement building during the 1970s and 1990s in the Caribbean. He has a wide knowledge of the history of racial politics in the 1970s and the Grenada Revolution, 1979-1983. According to a 2019 published interview with him, he has always emphasized the need for Caribbean solidarity among progressives and the constant review of the effectiveness of creative application of social and political theory. So it is now my pleasure to ask him to give the official welcome and to say a little bit about why the St. Lucia Reparation Committee thought it critical to forge links with other entities to conceptualize and implement this lecture series. Mr. Busquet. Thank you very much, Professor Shepard, uh, for this generous introduction. And um, welcome everybody to our ninth consecutive Caribbean history and reparations lecture, where and when every fourth Thursday of every month since September 2020, we have taken the message directly to regional schools and increasingly so during the COVID-19 pandemic that has haunted us as much in 2020 as in 2021. As always, our message is primarily to secondary students preparing for history exams. And today we look at the road to Caribbean independence. Of course, Caribbean independence was established in the name of the entire region, first by Haiti in 1804, defeating the three European powers or three powers to establish the world's first black republic followed by neighboring Cuba and Venezuela, all of which fought wars and shed blood for their independence. 
our Caribbean story in CARICOM is quite different, mainly British, French, and Dutch islands and territories virtually handed independence on a plate like a buttered bread or kick to be fought over by opposing political parties or gladly to be received as a favor granted by a caring colonial master. And it is in that context that as Madam Chair has asked, we took the decision almost a year ago to launch this series of lectures at the regional and national levels so that we could take the whole history, the story, our story, not his story of us, but our story in this case to our students at secondary schools across the region. And we are glad to welcome you to this, our ninth consecutive lecture in that regard. And our presenters today will tell and show you how the whole question of independence being a gift from our benevolent colonial masters was never really true that we indeed struggled for our independence, albeit peacefully and politically within the limits allowed by colonial rule. And then there was that period I like to refer to as grudging British apprenticeship for independence uh, through the process of associated statehood that reshaped colonial rule to accommodate local uh, voices, but within the realm of the empire. In the case of St. Lucia, the island was elevated in the colonial realm to statehood status in 1967, a full 12 years before independence in 1979. And then independence became a partisan political football between the two major parties for the elections of that year. Because the opposition opposed independence being made an election issue by the ruling party at the time, Independence Day, the 22nd of February 1979, was virtually like a lockdown and curfew from midnight with royal British snipers guarding the Queen's representative during the highly restricted official ceremony to lower the Union Jack at Queen Elizabeth Dock in Port Castries. Independence Day in St. Lucia, the date for which has no historical relevance and was only pulled out of a cock hat during the constitutional talks at Lancaster House in London, coming on the eve of a general election less than five months away, resulted in more than half the population opting to welcome independence under self-quarantine at home. The Royal Jail in Castries was set afire on Independence Morning and the official ceremonies at Queen Victoria's Park was mainly attended by ruling party supporters, uniformed units, government officials, and students comprising the majority. Not all independence celebrations were the same in what was the West Indies Associated States, which is now CARICOM, between the 1960s and the 1980s. And as our presenters will tell you, that is so, including the story of Suriname, and those of the French colonies in the Caribbean described as overseas departments of France. As our moderator just said, our discussions today come 60 years after the first two countries got constitutional independence in the Caribbean. And as the chair and of the Caribbean CARICOM Reparations Commission and the this Caribbean Examinations Council, Sir Hilary Beckles, tends to always remind us to never forget that this is the time for transition to the next stage of Caribbean independence. But that, folks, will be for another lecture. Meanwhile, as with our lectures since May, Calabash TV has joined the NRC and all our local stakeholders to take these lectures and presentations not only directly to schools and the world online through UE Open Campus, Facebook and YouTube channels, but also directly to your TV screen on Flow Channel 110. 
We also welcome students and listeners online through Jamaica's nationwide radio and its ever popular Talking History program chaired by our esteemed historian, head of the Center for Reparations Research and our moderator for today, Professor Vereen Shepard. And most of all, we welcome the students, the teachers, the principals across the Caribbean and beyond tuned to us on your devices, as well as those joining us in the diaspora and at home or work. But we couldn't end today without also welcoming the new Grenada National Reparations Commission, which was officially launched in May and which has been cooperating with the St. Lucia NRC and the CRR to ensure that these lectures, including today's, gets to Grenadian students. So with all of this, here's hoping we learn as much as we can, all of us, not just students and teachers, but everyone tuned to today's lecture on the independence, the road to independence, the approach to Caribbean independence. Back to you, Madam Chair. Thank you so much. Um, thank you so much, Mr. Busquet, for not just welcoming, but giving the context within which we have been doing these lectures for a little while now. And uh, we have our final one coming up uh, in July. I know you're going to all miss what we have been doing for the past year. It's my pleasure now to introduce our speakers to you. We're going to begin with Mr. Armand Zunda, who is head of the Suriname CARICOM Reparations Commission. Our second speaker will be Mr. Dorbreen Omard. And of course, Dorbreen is a chairperson of the Antigua and Barbuda Reparations Support Commission. He's also one of the vice chairs of the CARICOM Reparation Commission. Then we're going to have a teacher who is always willing to be on talking history when he's called to service, Mr. Norman A. Malcolm, a teacher of history and Caribbean studies at Arden High School in Jamaica. So I'm going to turn over now to Arman Zunda. Mr. Zunda, you can tell the students anything about yourself that you think they should know, not just that you are the chair of the um, committee there in, in Sunam. So you have 15 minutes and um, your time starts now. Over to you, Mr. Arman Zunda. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, Professor Farin uh, Shepherd. Uh, my name is uh, Armand Sunder, and I'm an uh, economist uh, uh, trained in, uh, in the Netherlands at the University of Amsterdam. And um, actually, I've been uh, working in the financial sector for many, many years. And as a matter of fact, I have established three insurance companies, one in Suriname, uh, which is Self Reliance, one in Aruba, which is Empire Insurance, and one in Curaçao, which is uh, Promes Seguro. Um, and they were um, actually um, the first um, general insurance companies that were established by uh, local entrepreneurs. And uh, I've always also been working at the money and capital market of the central bank of, uh, of Holland. And now uh, I am uh, uh, one of the advisors of the uh, um, vice president uh, of uh, Suriname and also um, joining the trade union since I retired. I'm uh, the uh, uh, chairman of the oldest trade union in Suriname, which is PBO, and that was established in 1948. And today we will emphasize um, on uh, the theme of the lecture, which is uh, uh, movements towards independence in the Caribbean with uh, special emphasis on, on the, uh, the Surinamese case. 
Um, I, I would uh, um, actually appreciate if uh, the host can um, project my presentation. Is that possible? Yes, one moment. Okay. So we're just waiting for Mr. Zonda to share screen so that we can see the visuals for his presentation. But let me welcome again, everyone. Let us know you are here by posting in the chat. Remember, you can post your questions to the speakers in the chat. So I want to know which students are here, which schools you're from. So please be active in the chat. Okay, we have your presentation over to you again, Mr. Zunda. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Professor. Um, can I get the, the second uh, page and can you assist me by, um, yes, uh, no, the second one, this is the first one, thank you. Yes, uh, when we talk about uh, independence, we have to um, actually realize where it started. And uh, to a certain extent, uh, regarding to Surna, uh, it started in 1650. Uh, and here you already start to see the relation between uh, the colonialist uh, nations, but also the relations with uh, the Caribbean nations. Um, Actually, one of the colonials, uh, colonialists called Mr. Francis Willoughby, he actually came from Barbados and started the uh, a colony here in Suriname. That was in 1650. And from 1650 until 1667, actually Suriname was a Dutch uh, colony. And besides that, also in two later periods, starting from 1799 till 1802 and from 1802 till 1816 uh, Suriname was also uh, occupied by by the British being a British uh, protectorate and uh, British under British uh, temporary rule um, as a matter of fact the um, occupation by the Dutch started in uh, 1660s 67, and here you also see the relationship with Bin Suriname, Suriname and the Caribbean nations, because uh, in um, 1667, approximately or probably more than 1,000 um, uh, owners of, uh, of colonies of or plantations in Suriname, they left for uh, Suriname. Um, to Jamaica, established themselves in Jamaica. And um, in 1683, you see that um, actually the company that, that um, uh, occupied uh, Suriname for the Dutch government is called the Hoogtorier de Société of Suriname. Um, and that company, um, in that company, the Dutch West Indian uh, company participated for one third of the shares. It was a private company. And the other uh, one third was actually um, in the possession of a Dutch uh, nobleman called Cornelis van Aarsen van Sommelsdijk. And one third was actually occupied by the city of Amsterdam. And in 1770, you see that the city of Amsterdam actually um, possessed two thirds of the colony of Suriname. And calculations that we have made, can I get the other uh, slide, please? Um, calculations that uh, we have uh, made shows that it, in the period 1683 until 1939, approximately 125 billion euro was extracted by uh, Dutch colonialists uh, to especially Amsterdam and uh, the province of, of Sealand. Um, 
Of course, uh, the population in, in, in Suriname did resist the occupation. It started actually uh, from the start. And in, in 1686, the first treaty with uh, the indigenous people uh, was signed. And then later on, uh, in the next century, in 1760, different treaties were actually signed with uh, what we actually call the uh, guerrilla fighters of then. Some people say, um, especially when um, uh, they talk about his, his story, they talk about runaway slaves. But we talk about the guerrilla fighters that actually left the plantations and started the guerrilla warfare uh, against the colonialists at that time. Nowadays, these people are also called uh, the Maroons. Uh, the struggle for um, independence, you could say, culminated in the 1930s again, uh, because as you know, in 1921-29, there was a, a world crisis started in, starting in, in uh, New York at the stock exchange. And from 90, uh, from that time until you could say 34, actually there were there was a lot of unemployment all over the world, and also in Suriname. From that period, actually, the trade union movement started, and the leaders that were uh, that came forward were Mr. Louis Doodle, and um, as a matter of fact, Mr. Louis Doodle was uh, taken into custody in a psychot psychiatric uh, institute where he stayed for 43 years. Um, and, uh, and that is where also he died. Mr. Anton de Com, who was, is also one of the heroes of that time, this, this uh, trade union leader was actually banned from Suriname and sent uh, to, to Netherlands where he um, also joined um, uh, the, um, you could say, the, the guerrilla that was there, and he actually died in a Dutch concentration camp. Next slide, uh, slide please. Uh, so this is the capital, uh, capital cash inflows in the Netherlands that I just talked about. It happened in the per period 1684, ending just before World War II. And in that period, uh, sugar, mostly sugar, approximately 60% of the amount, coffee, cotton, cacao, gold, also woods were actually transported or extracted from the Surinamese economy and went to Holland. The net present value um, in euros of 2016 is 125 billion euros. Next, uh, please. What we also have done, I, I don't see the, uh, uh, the graph, but I can look at it here in my paper. We have actually calculated the wage bill for non-payment to enslaved Africans. And um, in um, actually the period of, of real chattel slavery was 1683, uh, where the fi figures actually are available, because it started in 1650, but from 1683, we actually gathered the, the data. And during that period, the wage bill was approximately 3.3 billion Dutch florins. And from 83, 1863, for the 10 years, uh, it was 206 million uh, florins. And for the period 1683, going to 1939, it was, so for the total period, the wage bill that was never paid was 4.5 billion florins, which is equivalent to the net present value of 31 billion 
euro calculated for the year 2016. And uh, the point is that as part of the reparation uh, process, we could uh, actually demand from the Dutch government now that this bill uh, should be settled, this bill of 31 billion uh, euros. Next uh, slide, please. Um, as a matter of fact, in most Caribbean nations and also in Suriname, um, the uh, um, political parties uh, started after uh, the local political party started in 1947, 1946 after the World War II. And in Suriname, actually, the division actually continued uh, because, as you know, the colonial colonials also uh, mostly use uh, the strategy of divide and rule. And so the political parties were, um, were constructed or were established along ethnic, ethnic and religious lines. Um, and uh, these are also the current political parties in Suriname. And I can mention uh, some of them, which is the VHP, that's the traditional Hindustani party, KTPE is a traditional Japanese party, NPS is a traditional Creole party, and PNR, that is a Creole party, but um, a party that consists mostly, consisted mostly of nationalists. And this party actually was actually the, the party that uh, wanted to discuss the matters of independence actually from the start of their existence. Next slide, please. And here we have a, um, a combination of political independence or constitutional independence and economics. Because uh, as we see, these things are very interrelated. Uh, independence was established, constitutional independence was established on November 25th of 1975. So last year, um, we uh, celebrated 45 years of independence in Suriname. But in, um, after independence was announced in 1973, mass migration started to the Netherlands. Uh, due to um, uh, the fact that uh, mo some people say that it was not um, organized properly. Um, it was actually organized um, uh, within a, um, a period of two years. Um, the people then have to actually arrange that. Um, the political independence was attained by a, co uh, a coalition of Creole political parties, and the first uh, uh, prime minister was Mr. Hank Aron. Aron. Uh, contrary to uh, the uh, uh, nations in the Caribbean, um, Suriname received an amount of three billion uh, Dutch guilders, uh, which is uh, approximately 2.1 billion euros um, as a golden handshake uh, um, for um, actually to uh, start the, in the independence uh, movement against, um, to follow the road of economic independence. But, because there's also a but when you talk about um, um, colonial nations or ex-colonial nations, this development aid was tight development aid. This implies that most of the services and goods you should attain from, Dutch, um, from the Dutch economy, Dutch entrepreneurs. And um, the, the amounts were destined to research, to exploration, exploration uh, for natural resources, infrastructure, energy, uh, agriculture, especially rice, mining, especially bauxite. 
And if you look at the balance of payments uh, during that period, let's say 1975 till 1980, then annually 300 million uh, Dutch florins were flowing into the economy, but <coughs> at the same time, an amount of 8 million was actually transferred as, tra as profits of uh, Dutch and other multinationals out of the Surinamese e economy. So net, there was actually an, 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 an outflow of half a billion um, uh, guilders at that time. Next slide, please. And then in 1980, we had our first coup d'etat here in Suriname, five years after independence. And the, it resulted in a second migration flow to the Netherlands. And actually the migration flow in the, from 1973 till 1975 and the last migration flow resulted in a big, big uh, migration, but also brain drain um, from Suriname. And um, actually the coup d'etat happened because the army was not too happy with the government, uh, with the spending of, of, of uh, funds and the distribution and funds, et cetera, et cetera. Next uh, slide, please. I think that's the end of your slides. Yes, uh, exactly. Uh, the next uh, slide is about uh, questions and remarks. It was a brief, uh, um, you could say, introduction on the whole matter of the way to independence. And I hope that um, um, it was understandable and that there are questions or remarks and we are very willing to answer those. Thank you, uh, Professor. Thank you very and much, Mr. Zunda. Thank you so much. The, uh, of course, we are inviting students and teachers to put questions in the chat so that what, is, what has not come out from this presentation will come out in the Q&A session. So it's now my pleasure to ask, of course, my colleague in the CRC, in the CARICOM Reparation Commission, Mr. Dobrin Omar, to make his 15 minute presentation. But you can take a minute to tell our students and teachers and the general audience anything else that you want to say about what you do. Over to you, Dobrin. Thanks so much, Professor Vivian Shepherd. Um, me, I, 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 I am considered and I do consider myself as, as a cultural activist, as author, as playwright, director, as lyricist, very, very involved in music production, um, uh, sponsoring, uh, sharing and producing musical programs in North Jazz and in Calypso. I'm a public health, public health trained, um, and I, I, I work as a consultant, as a consultant in sector planning across various, various um, sectors in this region. This webinar, I think, is staged at a very opportune time. But before I get there, let me acknowledge and thank the main contributors to the staging of this exchange of ideas. Uh, that is the St. Lucia National Reparations Committee, the Center for Reparation Research, and the University of the West Indies. I share comradely greetings to moderator, Professor Varin Shepherd, to Brother Earl Busquet, and to Brother Armand Zunda, fellow members of the CARICOM Reparations Commission, and also to fellow presenter, Norman Malcolm, whom I'm meeting for the first time. My pleasure, sir. Of course, I reserve very special greetings to all students and teachers and parents and others who are in attendance. I've been asked to spend the next 15 minutes about discussing with you movements towards independence across the Caribbean. And I thought that instead of attempting to chronicle the history, the movement, 
in this region from colony to federation to independence for the larger countries or from colony to federation to associated status with Britain to independence for the smaller territories. I thought that instead of doing that, um, that I would spend some time looking at what is happening in the non-independent countries of, of, of the region, the, the, the colonies in the region, with my focus on the British colonies, and to examine what is happening there and how that movement or those movements to independence are really taking place. And so I address essentially the situations um, in what I think six, six, six colonies, six remaining British colonies, Bermuda in the Atlantic, um, and in the Caribbean, Monset, Anguilla, British Virgin Islands, Cayman Islands, and the Turks and Caicos. They are now called non self governing. Um, territories, or the even more euphemistic, internally self-governing overseas territories of the United Kingdom. Formerly, they were known as United Kingdom overseas territories, and before that, British overseas territories, and before that, British dependent territories all clear linguistic gymnastics to hide the derogatory category or the derogatory tag of colony. They all lie in the path of the hurricane. There was a volcanic eruption in Montserrat in 1997. And the chief executive in all these countries is a governor appointed by the United Kingdom as a representative of the Queen. Now, the Charter of the United Nations Declaration on the Granting of Independence to Colonial Countries and Peoples of 14 December 1960 affirms that the subjection of peoples to alien subjugation, domination, and exploitation constitutes a denial of fundamental human rights and is an impediment to the promotion of world peace and cooperation. That committee year after year, continues to reiterate its conviction of the need for the eradication of colonialism and reaffirms that in 2013, for example, that there was no alternative to the principle of self-determination, which is also a fundamental human right as recognized on the relevant human rights conventions. I said opportune because this charter that deems colonialism a fundamental human, fundamental human right is up for its fourth international decade for the eradication of colonialism. The organ in the United Nations, the Special Committee on Decolonization that has responsibility for overseeing the implementation of the charter is chaired by a Caribbean person, Ambassador Keisha Maguire, who at the opening session of the committee this year in February, called on member states of the United Nations to note that this year we entered the first year of the fourth international decade for the eradication of colonialism. And she called on all member states to renew their commitment to strive to make this the last decade to be observed, fourth decade. So let's step back a bit and ensure that we understand in terms the same way. When I talk of independence, I'm really talking about political independence. And I, I, I say this particular to avoid discussion on whether any country in the world is independent in the dictionary meaning of the word. So independence for me is the ability to make final political and economic decisions for the governance of your country. My vision is not clouded by the quality of the decisions, so long as they are made by legitimate representatives of the citizens of the country. Um, great Pan-Africanist um, Nkrumah and other statements too have been very clear and understood certain things. Um, Nkrumah would have suggested that no people without a government of their own can expect to be treated on the same level as people of independent sovereign states. It is far better, he says, to be free to govern or misgovern yourself than to be governed by 
anybody else. But this is not the case in these colonies I mentioned. The colonial experience dominates their constitutions and therefore governance to include legal and parliamentary procedures as it does the health and education systems. Educate economic models and trade linkages are determined by the colonial experience also. Politics takes place in a framework of parliamentary representative democratic dependency fashioned by the United Kingdom Westminster model. The following status report was given to the visiting UN Special Committee to Munstrat in 2019 at its meeting with the Premier, Ministers and the Parliamentary Secretary. In general terms, um, the report describes the nature of colonial rule. Uh, some of the main points would be that the United Kingdom had retained control of internal security, external affairs, defense, the public service, and international financial services. That laws enacted by the Legislative Assembly in these colonies were subject to the assent of the United Kingdom. That the administering power had total control over the territory's affairs and could impose laws on them. That the situation in the territory where a non-elected official had more rights than those elected was a benevolent dictatorship and that there was no real democracy. And Monstratans complained as being treated as second class citizens with no respect. This is the state of colonial domination. Interestingly and importantly, it is felt by the leaders of these non-self-governing territories that the United Kingdom had a legal obligation to help to end its situation of dependency, as agreed in the 1960 Declaration on Decolonization, which states that all people have a right to self-determination and which also proclaim that colonialism should be brought to a speedy and unconditional end. There is little UK demonstration of acceptance of that fact. It's been close to 34 years since the last British colony sank its nevis achieved independence. 34 years for Britain, if mindful and respecting of the UN Charter, on the granting of independence to colonial countries and peoples, 34 years to have met its historical responsibility of leading these countries to some progressive form of self-government. But Britain exhibits little respect for the declaration. Its recent behavior points to an opposite motivation. It seems bent on increasing its involvement in the government of the colonies and demonstrates its colonial powers in many ways. For example, in 2012, 2009, it suspended the Turks and Caicos constitution for a period of two years, meaning that cabinet will no longer exist and the House of Assembly is dissolved and member seats are vacated. The constitutional right to trial by jury is also suspended with immediate effect, mandating the responsibility for government in the hands of an unelected government. It populates the technical and administrative arms of territorial governments with British technicians and have with no responsibility for succession planning. It continues to increase tight controls on the budgets and the finances of the territories, mandating issues such as limits on public debt, for example. It attempts to impose its domestic human rights agenda on its colonies, regardless of popular opinion and parliamentary decisions. In 2018, for example, Potential legislation attempts to grant British citizens the right to vote and hold elected offices in its overseas territories and to force recognition of same-sex marriages. Resolution 1514 and 1541 of the UN Assembly sets out three options for decolonization, namely one, independence, two, free association with an independent state or integration into an independent state. The UK response issued to the governor of Montserrat says simply that pursuant to the white paper on all the overseas territories published in 2012, in which the government of the United Kingdom had set out its overall approach 
to all its overseas territories, the United Kingdom would not prevent them from becoming independent if that was the wish of the populations. This is a fairly safe statement for the UK to make, even in its desire to hold on everlastingly to colonies. The reality today is that there does not seem to exist in any of the colonies a strong critical movement towards independence. This does not mean that there were no movements for independence before, or that there is no desire, no existing desire for independence among citizens. For example, there was an organization called the Anguilla Independence Movement in 1999. In 1990, the Chief Minister John Osborne of Munstrat recognized that most of the people of Munstrat, particularly the young, would like political independence. In 2012, for example, the Attorney General and Minister of Justice of Bermuda in a speech in Ecuador told the world that we look forward to one day ultimately sitting at the table with the other nations of the world as a confident, economically prosperous, politically stable, still beautiful and independent Bermuda. The Premier of the Cayman Islands in 2018 said in reaction that if the proposed human rights and voting rights legislation that I mentioned earlier, if they were implemented in, his, in, 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 in the Cayman Islands, then the country should pursue independence. But recent polls in Bermuda, for example, show that approximately 75% of the voting population rejects a move to independence. In Montserrat in 2012, the political leadership petitioned the United Nations to remove Montserrat from the UN decolonization list, stating that nationals had no desire to sever their relationship with the United them and have chosen to continue as an overseas territory and do not see themselves as being a colony. And this request was successfully withdrawn by the succeeding government, but which was at pains, however, to point out that its goal was financial independence. It is noted that public consultations show one, no support for a change in status, and two, that there were no ongoing discussions or public education related to self-determination as people were preoccupied with day-to-day -day issues. There's strong sentiment among leadership and peoples of the various territories that financial independence and our viable economy is a prerequisite to political independence. Presently in Munster, there is six months that is 60% dependent on the UK for its recurrent budget and over 90% for its capital program. The internal focus is therefore on infrastructural development to facilitate economic growth. The former Premier of Munstrat insisted that his country, that for his country to be decolonized, um, it, should, it would first require the provision of tools to grow the economy out of dependency, tools such as a safe harbor and seaport and improve the airport, better access and connectivity arrangements, a new hospital, the replacement of on the sea fiber cable optics and the development of geothermal and solar energy, road infrastructure, housing, and all those things of that nature. But this aversion to independence, as self-defeating as it seems, even among those who recognize past and present colonial abuses and the undemocratic nature of colonial governance. Why this aversion? I think that one, the struggles of neighboring Caribbean countries that have gone independent to include the tremendous debt load incurred to fix the colonial mess that Britain left in this region, a colonial mess of inadequate health and education facilities and poor infrastructure. But it should be noted that it is in the independent countries like Antigua and Barbuda, which have independent political power to advance their national interests, that airports and seaports and modern communication technologies and even universities have been developed. There is also, I think, a chronic lack of faith in the integrity and abilities of our own people, a lack of faith drilled 
into us through colonial education, through religion, and certainly through the media. And this is coupled with a lack of confidence in ourselves, a lack of confidence common in most post-colonial populations. These two issues are of importance to the reparations struggle. We call for reparations to remedy the existing crisis in both health and education, and to reverse the psychological trauma and damage inflicted on our people through hundreds of years of enslavement and colonialism. In addition, there is widespread belief that territories with small populations and land mass are not economically viable and therefore should never consider independence as their next steps in development. But well, St. Kitts and Nevis, for example, is a population of 52,000 people and a GDP per capita of approximately US $20,000 is independent. While the Cayman Islands, with its population of 65,000 people and a GDP per capita of nearly 85,000 US dollars, still debates the possibility of independence. That clearly size and GDP uh, has not been a considering factor, considered factor in the Cayman Islands to the movement to independence. In closing, I would like to make a quick comment on the role of the Special Committee on Decolonization. In 2012, its newly elected chairperson was calling for new strategies to ensure, and I quote, the final disappearance of the archaic concept of colonialism. And we notice by 2019, the recommendation recommendations of that committee, both to the administering state of the United Kingdom and to the, 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 the territories, the colonies, that those recommendations are now leaning towards the building of societies with basic infrastructure and services, looking at the employment for young people and women and implementation, importantly, of the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development. I end here before Sister Vereen ends <laughs> with a call to CARICOM and the independent countries um, of the region to assist these colonies to find a way out of colonial grasp. Um, mm -hmm. I think that we have witnessed no further examination of preparatory movements to independence, such as federation and associated status, roots that the present in the, in the independent countries um, took. I'll stop here. Um, there's quite a lot for discussion and perhaps some things will come up in the question and answer. Thank you so much, Dor Breen. I, I'm listening and I'm fascinated because you don't know this, but my task, one of my, one of the, my responsibilities as a member of the Committee on the Elimination of Racial Discrimination at the United Nations is to focus and report on every year the status of what they're calling the non-self-governing territories. And we should exchange our reports because I did make a report this year um, in April to the SARD because Article 15, of the International Convention on the Elimination of Racial Discrimination calls on CERD to report annually to track the meetings of the Committee on Decolonization and you know, to report on them. And I should just tell our, our, our viewers and listeners that there are 17 recognized self, non-self-governing territories scattered across Africa, the Caribbean, Europe, the Indian Ocean, North and South Atlantic and the Pacific. They are American Samoa, Guam, the US Virgin Islands, administered by the United States of America, Anguilla, Bermuda, British Virgin Islands, Cayman Islands, Gibraltar, Las Malvinas, they call it the Falklands, Montserrat, Pitcairn, St. Helena, Ascension, and Tristan da Cunha, and the Turks and Caicos Islands, all administered by the United Kingdom of Great Britain and Northern Ireland. Then you have French Polynesia and New Caledonia administered by France. Tokalo, formerly Union Island administered by New Zealand. And Western Sahara, which is a disputed territory claimed by Morocco and the Polisario Front. So you see colonialism is alive and well, not just in the Caribbean, but across the world. 
and uh, the, the the project of that CERD has is to comment on the petitions from within these these countries, you know, and they don't call them countries, they call them territories. But I've always been fascinated by the petitions emanating from within the territories, you know. And so what my question when the time comes to you will be to whether or have you have seen any of those petitions and what's the status of the people's discussions within those, those countries uh, as we speak. So let me turn quickly now to Mr. Norman Malcolm, or high school teacher. Mr. Malcolm, welcome. Say something about yourself to the students and teachers and the public watching. And then you have 15 minutes for your presentation from whichever perspective you take this topic. Okay. Um, thank you, Professor Shepard. Um, greetings to um, fellow panelists. Greetings also to students and teachers who are joining us. And I am very grateful um, for being included in this worthwhile discussion. Um, fun fact about me, I'm from Montego Bay. I think that that's, that's important. I'm from the Western side of Jamaica. Um, history has always been a passion and something that I, I believe strongly in, and especially the teaching of history in our schools. I think it is, this conversation reaffirms the need for the conversation among, especially young people, who, for want of a better word, are not necessarily, you know, willing or being given an opportunity to participate in such conversations. Um, my presentation will focus on the French West Indies. And moderator, can you go ahead, please? All right, so for the purposes of my presentation, this is the, the question that I'd want to have in the back of your mind going throughout. Is the French, is the French West Indies independent or dependent? Now, the French, like other European colonizers, saw their colonies as a unitary system of mercantile operation, political management, and jurisdiction. So basically, they saw their colonies as existing for the benefit of the metropole. And as a result of that, there are two staunch or startling um, consequences. One is the integration of colonies along imperial lines, and two, the geopolitical fragmentation of the unified Amerindian world. So we talk about linguistic and cultural, especially in the context of the French West Indies, we're going to be looking at assimilation. Next slide, please. Now, the French Antilles, you know, the sentiment of it was intimately related to the development of sugar plantations. And as a result, La Serre and Mableau refer the consequences as being the rapid disappearance of indigenous people, the rapid importation of Africans, and the forced interbreeding of blacks and whites. And I must pause that generally when we hear independence in the French West Indies, we'll think of Haiti. But Haiti is so great and so grand that its movement, you know, it gets its own focus. But for the purposes of my presentation, I'll be looking at the French Antilles, looking at Martinique and Guadeloupe and others. Continue, please. Now, here is a clip from Sugarcane Alley. It's a minute long and uh, you can just listen for a bit and then I'll explain what it entails. All right, so it seems that there is a, a sound issue. Now, the film Sugarcane Alley um, takes place in 1930s Martinique, when Africans working in sugarcane fields were still subjected to severe treatment by their white employers. It's based on Joseph Soboy's semi-autobiographical novel of the same name. And in this clip here, what you're seeing is a young boy who stole a ledger that basically proved that the whites, the Becks, in Martinique were actually stealing from the Blacks and paying them less. So what you'll hear here, you'll hear a 
a black woman singing, Martinique, you suffer, life is fading away. Young folk are regressing, the men and the women are desperate. Yet we all live simply. What we lack is money, and as for justice, don't even mention it. You I just hold one second, Mr. Malcolm. Can't we? Is there anything we can do so we can hear this? It, what is wrong with the audio? Um, I just wanted to, to find out from the technical people if we can solve this. It would be really good to, to hear this. Can we try again to play this? Is it from your side, Mr. Malcolm, or from? No, it, it's. Side? I think we're from the technical side because it's, it's actually embedded in the presentation. In the in the PowerPoint, oh, right? John or can you can, can can the yeah. the person sharing stop the share and um, redo the share with the audio option enabled, please. All right, let's um let's see if that can happen. While while we're waiting, um. Just let me remind everyone that we are appreciating questions. This is a good chance for you to interact with, your, with our speakers or educators. So don't be shy. Make sure that you send in your questions. And my assistant, John Shorter, will be monitoring YouTube and our Facebook so that you can post your questions. Okay. Um, are we trying again then? Let's try again. Right, so for those persons who are not French speakers like myself, what in the translation here, it says, Martinique, you suffer, life is fading away. Young folk are regressing, the men and the women are desperate. Yet we all live simply. What we lack is money, and as for justice, don't even mention it. I crossed over the, crossed over the sea to go and see what was happening in Guadeloupe. Their suffering is like ours, this deep-rooted misery in our guts. Who among us can tear it out? How terrible, terrible it is. The people cry famine. Life has become impossible in this land. Yet life could be easy. Money and justice are what's needed to end our suffering. So it, this film, Sugarcane Alley, it chronicles life in Martin, as I mentioned, in the 1930s. And in the 1930s, this will also tie into the rise of negritude in the French Caribbean and Africa as well, coming off the heels of the Harlem Renaissance, which was influenced, a new Negro Renaissance out of the United States. And you'd have had um, key personalities like uh, Amy Cesare, Leopold Senghor, who would have written extensively, and Damas, especially his poem Pigments, 1937, which is basically regarded as a manifesto of the negritude movement. Next slide, please. <laughs> Now, the, the question therefore is, what is independence? And if you look on to the right of your screen, you'll see a picture of France or what we consider to be France today. And you will see mainland France highlighted and you'd also see the departments highlighted. So you'll see Guadeloupe and Martinique under Dom Tom and, and other spaces. Now, when we talk about independence, independence is a state in which a person, nation, country, or state's people and population, or a portion of them, have self-government, and in most cases, sovereignty over their area. Now, the question, therefore, needs to be asked, um, are the departments equal to the whole? And then, so might then ask the next question, 
they're equal, but are they the same? And I'll dare say that Guadalupe, for, for example, Guadalupe and Martinique would not necessarily be the same. Yes, they may be equal on paper, but they're not the same. Considering the geographical conditions, considering the, the context of colonial history, 300 years uh, um, of said issues. So that would have created a, a very specific situation that although they would have been assimilated into France, they would not necessarily be considered to be the same. And this would shape uh, through colonization, colonization rather, that would shape the experiences of the persons in the French Antilles. And, you know, especially looking at the fact that, you know, the same persons who are pushing or push this whole notion of assimilation from France would have been the same instigators of colonialism and slavery and establishment of these systems in the region. Continue, please. So then this particular question by Marius Matet in the debate that was happening in France upon, rather not upon, but before the passage of the overseas department, the law that granted the status of overseas departments, will the populations of these former colonies always be governed by Paris or will they govern themselves? And it's an important question that in our discussion later on, it, it, that must be answered because yes, you will consider them to be overseas apartments and yes, they'll be given a place in the assembly and stuff like that. But really, what does independence look like? It, is, it, will it ever be a situation that it is sufficient for them to just be overseas departments or are there other things that we need to take into consideration when looking at the French Antilles? Continue, please. So the policy that was instituted was one of cultural assimilation. And this cultural assimilation was used in Africa and the West Indies. So you would know, for example, looking at the, this such policy that that would encapsulate places like Senegal, um, which was one of the ex prime examples of where this assimilation took place in Africa. But then when you look, for example, within the Caribbean, the whole idea of cultural assimilation was a turn, like the Africans, French Antillean people, into Frenchmen through education. So there was this notion then that we would, not we, but France, would use education to push the narrative of having Blacks, African, those of African ancestry, assimilated into French life, French culture, French cuisine, French dress. So they will not be... French speaking, but they'd be French because they thought, as mentioned here, that their civilization had reached a pinnacle of achievement and set out to impose their culture on other parts of the world. So the French sought to assimilate culturally after slavery in 1848, which was in contrast to the British who saw those in the colonies as subjects to the subjects of the crown. So the whole matter of colonization was problematic and this assimilation process Though in theory, yes, there were been some benefits that came from the whole matter of assimilating, but there are still significant gaps and questions left to be asked of this particular um, policy within the French Antilles. Continue. So therefore, um, the question still remains, what does independence look like? And if you look, for example, at this picture displayed here, it represents uh, three young girls dressed in a particular fashion. And this picture is indeed very poignant. And if you understand the context of the French Antilles and looking at the whole point of assimilation, I'm sure we'll have some questions around this particular picture. Thank you. Over to you, Professor Shepard. Thank you so much to all three speakers for excellent presentations. I have to say that I like the perspectives 
presented by each of you, by, by each speaker, the various perspectives presented by all three, because you didn't only talk about the road to independence, that is how Jamaica got independence, how Trinidad and Tobago got independence, how Antigua Barbuda and, and, and all the CARICOM independent nations and other nations got their independence. You actually critiqued the failure of some of our neighbors to get independent, to get independence, to become independent. And I think that's a very good place for our students to be, meaning questioning why not independence? Why independence and why not independence? And I'm hoping that we have some questions, but uh, so far um, I, I'm not seeing any questions in the chat posted to me. Um, John, are there any questions on YouTube? Um, Mr. Buske, you want to start us off? Yes, certainly. Um, can you Go ahead. Me? Well, yes, until yes, we yes. get some, some questions. Yes, um, um, thank you, yes. Mr. Malcolm and uh, Joe Breen, having uh, given attention to the non English speaking uh, Caribbean. And insofar as the Martinique and Guadeloupe experiences are concerned, I could um, quite remember uh, the assimilation uh, problem being identified all the way back between the 70s and 80s, particularly ahead of elections when young uh, persons would be invited to take up um, easy opportunities to assimilate in France and become French citizens and therefore qualify for everything in Europe and therefore they just border France to um, France and at the same time to encourage elderly pensioners um, from France and um, other French colonies to repatriate or to go to Martinique and Guadeloupe. Um, there was also the ridiculous, um, the various ridiculous manifestations of uh, these different islands and territories um, being named in the sort of linguistic gymnastics that Dobrin referred to, having to operate equal and as the same to the extent that I don't know if it still happens now, but every year the French the cities in Martinique and Guadeloupe and Cayenne would have to repatriate funds that came for the shoveling of snow because snow didn't fall for the year. And um, on the whole issue, I wanted to um, remind that the, in, in speaking about the French overseas departments in the Caribbean Cayenne, which is um, called French Guyana, which is over three times the size of, Guyana, of, of, of France and has been subject to the highest level of natural resource exploitation in any of France's colonies outside of Africa requires a greater level of attention on our part because the independence struggle there is quite very much advanced, more advanced than um, Martinique and Guadeloupe historically. I wanted to make those few points. Okay, thank you. So you have made a few points. I wanted to ask Dobrin though, uh, why do you think that um, certain countries at certain places in the Caribbean are not counted among the non-self-governing territories. Puerto Rico does not, I mean, from time to time, they allow petitions from Puerto Rico, but it's not covered in the UN um, list of 17. And uh, as Earl says, Guadeloupe, Cayenne, Martinique, St. Barthélemy, Saint Martin, they're not listed either. Neither the Dutch ABC Islands, um, Aruba, Bonaire, Curaçao, then the Dutch part of that island of St. Martin, which I think um, P 
people in St. Martin who want to just get rid of this division. And uh, uh, Stacia, St. Eustatius, why do you think that they picked out just 17 and not refer to the others um, in that way? Dorbrin, I'll start with you. Uh, I, I, I think that this, this just has to do with the administering territories, rejecting the concept of colony. Sorry, Dorbrin. Um, seem as if you're frozen. So we'll I'll, until you come back in. Dorbin, are you hearing us? No? Okay. There's a question. Hello? Oh, yes. You're, um, you're back. And we didn't hear the answer at all. You were frozen for okay. a while. Okay. Um, I, I am saying that. Uh, this has to do, I think, again with 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 the linguistics, with 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 how countries, administering countries, choose to call their colonies. Um, so the word colony is not used at all. So we talk of U.S. territories in the Caribbean, Puerto Rico, U.S. Virgin Islands, etc. We talk of departments of France, Martinique, Guadeloupe, yes. Cayenne, etc. Departments of France. Um, I think the Dutch territories are talking about special territories, um, affording them the, the concept of special territories, and so they are not being recognized essentially as colonies in the sense that we are looking at the British colonies. Although those of course now have also have a special name and they soon fall off that list, um, mm -hmm. that list for decolonization. When we begin to talk about non-self-governing or self-governing territories of the United Kingdom, etc., I think no. it's just linguistics. Yes, but have you in your research detected any support for independence within the places you covered. In, in, some, in some of the countries, in some of these 17, the, 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 administer, the administering powers say that a referendum is necessary to decide if they should become independent. And in some of these 17, a two thirds majority saying they want independence is, is necessary. Uh, have you come across that? Have you come across any support for independence and how large or small is that movement? I, I, I would say it's, it's extremely small across mm -hmm. this region, except um, growing, strong growing movement in St. Martin at this point in time, um, which I think you know, we need to, 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 to take a closer look at. But that, that, that seems to be the most active uh, movement for independence across the region right now. Well, strong movements, of course, in Martinique and Guadeloupe in the French departments also. I am not too sure about, about, uh, about Cayenne. Um, but the idea of a referendum, I think, is common to all countries, uh, all the British countries I'm talking of, and the idea of a two-thirds majority virtually makes it impossible. When in, in our territories that have been divided along political lines, government and opposition, it is going to be extremely difficult for any government to get a two-thirds majority in a referendum on virtually anything. We mm -hmm. saw the major failures um, in Antigua and in Grenada of attempting to get a two thirds majority to join the Caribbean Court of Justice. As simple as that, the Caribbean mm -hmm. Court of Justice, well established, mm -hmm. well run, well financed, and yet governments, a government in Grenada, which I think at that point in time probably held all the seats of parliament. And here in Antigua that held 12, um, of the 17 seats or 13 of the 17 seats could not get a 50% majority in referendum. And so uh, we are boxed in, in many ways, mm -hmm. by the constitutions. And, and perhaps by the failure to educate the population about the benefits of whatever we're asking them to support because of partisan politics. I mean, I think we we have to confront that. But, but let me shift, I'll come back to you in a while, but let me shift to, there's a question on YouTube for um, Dr. Zunda. 
How was the unpaid wages for enslaved people in Suriname calculated? What, what method did you use to calculate? If you could unmute, um, Dr. Zunda, please unmute. Yes, uh, uh, Professor. Did, you, did you, you hear the question? Yes, I, I heard the question, okay. but All if right. you allow then I, I wanted to elaborate just for a while on the matter of independence regarding the Dutch territories. Okay, go ahead. Sure. Curaçao, Aruba, Bonaire, Saba, St. Eustatius. Mm -hmm. As a matter of fact, these territories are integrated into the Dutch system. And it was based on, on a referendum uh, called 10 10 10. The referendum was held on the 10th of October in 2010. And there the population actually decided that to want, they want us to stay with, with Holland because uh, most of them uh, actually benefit from the social security system that the Dutch have actually implemented in Curaçao. And another point is that um, some of the a population they refer to Suriname, where actually after independence, um, um, you could say that um, our people, our politicians, um, actually failed to manage the economy properly. So instead of uh, thinking that they could do it better, could do a better job, they refer to actually what was gone, what. Um, was done wrong in, in another territory. So um, that's what I, I wanted to mention regarding the, um, the fact that um, these uh, uh, islands, um, they have, um, I, I want to add to that their economy is, uh, they don't have uh, almost uh, uh, any natural resources. So um, they are based on surfaces. Uh, offshore financial services and tourism. And, and uh, so um, uh, they, they choose um, in 2010 to uh, stay under the wings uh, uh, of, of, of Holland. Okay, that, that's then my response to uh, uh, the matter of uh, dependency or independency of uh, the Dutch uh, territories. Mm -hmm. Re regarding the calculation, um, I would first want to refer to a book that I published uh, in, in, uh, in 2010, where I introduced a, a method to calculate uh, uh, reparations based on the net present value. And it's actually the same uh, methodology uh, that I have used. Um, uh, what what um, to uh, give some um, some guidelines? Uh, look, what we uh, have gathered in information is the import value of uh, the goods uh, that we refer to. That were sugar, uh, coffee, cacao, and cotton, and um, we have. Um, actually calculated in those periods what the, uh, the revenues were in Holland. Uh, then we refer to uh, the fact that it was uh, not mechanized uh, labor, but hand labor. And um, we actually um, um, put the premises that uh, uh, the, the uh, wage value would be approximately 60%. And that 60%, we calculated the net press value for the different periods. In general, I could say that that uh, methodology was used. OK. Uh, um, I think one of the reasons that was asked is that in the case of the CARICOM region, there was an yes some years back to make a calculation of what reparation would look like. And they, in terms of wage values, they actually used the, what, a, what a, a, a wage worker in the UK would have been paid 
um, in the 18th century. Multiplied by the number of field workers, let's say, and uh, applied interest, and then they came to a calculation. So I think it was whether you, you, you used the calculation at that micro level of what wages would have, if, if enslaved people had been paid, you know, what, what would each, what was the, what would be the, the wage, like a weekly wage or something like that? Uh, and would there have been a difference between say field workers, artisans, you know, the skilled workers, men and women, was there gender division uh, of wages? Was there, you know, the sex typing of wages, that kind of thing. So you can think about that and come back in in a while. I want to shift to Mr. Malcolm uh, to ask the same question about whether, what, what is the level of support or opposition to independence in the fr French overseas territories as they are called? Um, well, I think depending on the particular territory you're looking at, you might find that there is variation, and especially looking at the time period. Because I know, mm -hmm. for example, in the 50s that you had the varying riots that would have taken place in Martinique and Guadeloupe. Then you look, for example, in 2017 with the issues in French Guiana. And all of those issues, you know, the criticisms of France and the fact that the you know, French Guiana was, was um, exploited and continues to be exploited for the benefit of, of France. And then you'd have looked, for example, as well at the, the development of the negative movement. And then that was countered by Creolite with Glissant, you know, pushing this notion then that the Caribbean, for example, uh, they're so varied from coming from varying backgrounds that it is difficult for them to be fully integrated into a system that really does not serve their need, that doesn't look like them. So on the surface, it's, it's good to say that, yes, you're assimilated as part of France, but the reality is based on the context and, the, and the, the historical factors, it would be difficult for that to take place. And the reality yeah. is that France has, for example, now is suffering from this policy of assimilation because, you know, they went into Africa and said, yes, man, you are French. But then now you have the blacks going into, going into France, you have the Muslims going into France, and they're saying, no, not you, you don't look like us. So that mm -hmm. now creates another issue. So I mm -hmm. think, for example, if you look, for example, in Martinique and Guadeloupe and even and French Guiana, there's still those persons who are pushing, especially in French Guiana, pushing for independence um, from, from mm -hmm. France. But we'll, we'll see how that progresses in the next couple of years. There, there's a notion in the Caribbean uh, that when, let's say, Martinique, Guadeloupe, when they look at the British the former British colonies or the independent um, English speaking Caribbean countries now that they are close to, they make a comparison and say mm -hmm. economically they are better off uh, than those independent countries. And therefore they don't see the value of, of, of independence in the political, in the, maybe in the political sphere, but not in the economic sphere. Um, does that come up in your reading? Right, it, it did, it did. Because one of the things, uh, the question that left my, um, that was left in my mind was the fact that, you know, independence. So they would look on, for example, at the, at the Caribbean, those who are, who are independent and ask, does it really make sense economically or politically for us to become independent? But then on the flip side though, you know, the sense of self, because the reality mm -hmm. is they have had to push down there, this notion of okay, I am. This is what it means to be Martinican or Guadeloupean, and accept this idea of French that's being imposed on them, so that they could assimilate and be considered. So yes, you have these wonderful economic opportunities with the EU and all the all the trappings that come with being French, but at the same time, the identity issue that you know is not necessarily given a platform within such conversations. Mm -hmm. Um. So, um, Zunda, is that the same? Yeah, well, well, I think you answered that. You, 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 you talked about the economic benefits that people see and they prefer the, the social benefits too. But yes. look, when you look at Suriname now, um, I was amazed at how many political parties you, asked, you identified and how they seem to be divided along ethnic lines. So Suriname is independent, but how is the independence actualized 
um, because of the ethnic divide. Does that come up? Is that an issue in Suriname now? It, it is an issue, but uh, politicians, they tend to say that um, it's a, a beautiful garden, you know, but uh, um, it's, uh, you could say there are also income differences uh, in, in uh, um, or the spread of income between the ethnic groups. And I must say that the indigenous people and uh, the black people in Suriname are actually um, in the lowest uh, um, income, income group. Uh, of course, there are some uh, um, exceptions, but you could say in general. And uh, the fact is that um, that is a process that ha has been changed, not to the good, but to the bad. Um, and and um, for, for example, now um, we are in, in, a, uh, in a period where uh, Suriname um, wants to uh, sign a, a, a um, extended fund facility with the IMF. And, and uh, uh, critical people like us, for example, uh, are showing the government that uh, especially these, uh, uh, let's say black people will suffer in, in that process. And so um, you could say we didn't have uh, those tensions that they had in Guyana and where um, uh, there was a struggle, um, people were fighting, but um, still you see that uh, the, the, the income gap and the spread of income um, is not even uh, here, here, here in Suriname. Okay. Well, all yes. right, I'm going to allow each panelist. I'm, I'm sorry, sorry, did I interrupt you? Go ahead. If there are other questions uh, for me, because uh, my secretary just mentioned to me that I have to leave to the office of the vice president. Oh, okay. Well, would you like to give a, um, your closing thoughts now, and then I will pose the other questions to the other two panelists. Give, um, what would you like to say about the ind about independence as we reflect on independence in Suriname? Has it worked or has it not worked? Is it better to have it even with the economic problems or not? Your closing thoughts. Yes, uh, I think that uh, the, the challenge in Suriname is a matter of leadership. And um, we have to acknowledge that uh, leadership hasn't been optimal in Suriname up to this stage. So it's a challenge for the youth and for the young people to um, actually um, uh, try to develop a, a country with so many natural resources and so many also intellectuals, but most of them are in Holland. Um, that that's a challenge uh, for them. And that is why also reparations is so important because we have to learn from the past and we have to settle the accounts with our ex-colonial uh, with the ex-colonial country, and that these young people actually pave the the, the path forward to um, establish a, a good economics, uh, for example, a diversified economy, not based on natural resources, which has been the past and is still the case. And, um, that this, then, and that they consider the spread of uh, income and, and the spread of wealth, uh, which will be very uh, important in, in, in the case of, of, of Suriname. Okay. Well, thank you very much, Dr. Zunda, for joining us today. I know you have to go and we'll let you do that. But um, I'm sure we can call on you again. We, because what we plan to do for July is to um, have all the speakers for the year come back and okay. students, which, whichever question they missed, you know, they never had time to assimilate, you know, the information. So all of you will be invited back. So we'll be in touch with you again for July. All right. But thank you so much. Okay. So thank you. And also the other speakers and also the listeners and especially the students. 
Okay, thank you. Um, thank you. John Green, I asked John to show that map of the spread of non-self-governing territories. I'm gonna ask him if he could just put that map up now. We're just waiting. Um, okay, so this is, if you could just point the arrow and identify, yes. So you, you just to show you the, the geographical location of the what, what the UN calls the non-self-governing territories and the 17 that have been identified. Some you covered, um, Dobrin. But, but just, to, just to show you where, where these, we are calling the remaining colonies anyway, and there are far more than these as we know, but these are the recognized ones, so you see how far. And you also see how small some of them are in size. And you wonder, those who are saying, well, you know, I don't, we don't, we don't, we can't really let, let them govern themselves because they're too small, the populations are too small. The question is, and Dobrin, I think you, you, you refer to this, Selkis Nivis, you know, you could, you could refer to Selkis Nivis as, you know, geographically small as well, but they are managing their economy. So does size matter or it's a matter of, uh, as uh, I think uh, Mr. Malcolm said, self-respect and, and wanting to, as, 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 as suppose, um, or Archie say, rule your destiny. Would you say rule your destiny? It's, we want to rule our destiny. So thank you, John, for showing that map. And we go back now. I'm asking Mr. Malcolm and um, Dobrin, do you have questions for each other? Dobrin, do you have a question for Mr. Malcolm? And then I'm going to give Earl Bosque the floor. Mm -hmm. you're, you're muted, Dobrin. Ah. Yeah, go ahead now. Yes. No, I, I really don't, don't have a question. I would just really like to, to hark back to the question you asked me earlier. Yes, um, go I ahead. think that Arman, Arman has just nudged my memory about that 10, 10, 10 of the integration of territories into the Netherlands. And integration was one of the three options that I had mentioned for that the United Nations considered uh, for decolonization, so that we do have the integration into an independent state, that, as, as in the Dutch examples. And the third one, beside independence, the other one I mentioned was the whole question of a, a free association with an independent territory. And I think mm -hmm. that it is under that rubric that the United the Territories, the United States territories are considered to be off that decolonization list. Okay. I am also glad, very, um, just one more second, I'm also glad that we showed that map because I think a lot of our um, discussions about independence and about why the, why the administering um, countries continue with this colonization is this whole question that we have not given much consideration to of exclusive economic zones. Yes. Um, that under the UN Charter, the law of the sea, back uh, I think about 1980, 1982 maybe, the, the, these EEZs, um, areas in which a sovereign state has special rights regarding the exploitation and use of marine resources, including energy production from water and wind. And because of colonies or because of departments, let's say, for example, France has the largest EEZ in the world. And, and this is not because of of, 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 of the sea border in France. That is extremely small relatively, but because of its independent, of its departments scattered across the world, it now has um, the largest EEZ. And this is particularly important. It's of course followed by the United States of America and the United Kingdom a bit lower um, down the list. But these are some of the considerations which I think we must put on the table as to why there is resistance of offering mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. independence to a mm -hmm. number of the smaller territories here in the Caribbean. All right. After Mr. Malcolm speaks and Mr. Bousquet, I'm going to come back to you for a one minute closing statement. But I really want to nudge you, Dobrin, as someone who lives in the CARICOM region, uh, to say 
what have been the promises unfulfilled of independence in our region? Or let me put it another way, the benefits and the pitfalls of independence as we look towards next year when Trinidad and Tobago and Jamaica will be 60 years um, on. Um, has it worked for us? Has it not? Maybe one minute is too short, but that's what I will have. So you'll have to condense your your. Mm -hmm. Do you have any questions for Dobri? Um, any, any, anything else you want to add? Uh, I wanted to ask you, for example, if this is a topic that your students like, um, do they choose this topic, the history students, for review for CXC? Well, um, as it relates to that, uh, they, they generally go along the lines of looking at the British Caribbean. So it's about the, the, the movement towards independence in the British Caribbean. They, they generally shy away from the French because mm -hmm. I realize mm -hmm. even with my colleagues that it's not something that, that is widely examined, um, mm -hmm. looking at the, the French. Should we, should we nudge them towards that by having comparative questions in the essay section of the, of the, I, I, the paper too? I, I, I think so. I think so. But by having that comparative element, we'll be forcing them to um, immerse themselves into the content, which I think what it is, they're saying, like, okay, well, I have the option of not focusing on that. So let me not look at that any at all. Does the syllabus allow them to consider this comparative dimension? Um, in an, it, it, it's dependent on the teacher. So for example, how I normally do it, I'll go through teaching the, the, the British, then the Dutch, then the, then the French, and then have them do a comparative look. And, mm -hmm. and this on that, no, reflect on what were some of the issues that, that stood out? What do, what do they see as possible next steps, especially for the French? And why is it that they think that they, the French would have pushed this culture of assimilation? And then, and as Dobrin mentioned, the whole matter of political standing globally because France is one of the major superpowers. And if it is that you were to give up these small colonies in terms of space and, and what, that, what that would do to its standing, and especially now in a 21st century world where everybody is jostling for position. You have China who's, who is moving further up. There's the issues with America. Now France is using this now, um, the colonies, as a means of saying, hey, this is who I am. But at the same time, culturally, it's having all of these ships taking place with the Muslims coming in and the, the, the blacks going in and the racial issues, the racial tensions. Now, one is now left to question, would th these departments be considering the fact that, you know, this is clearly saying that you're not necessarily welcomed mm -hmm. by the establishment. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so that's self, that self-respect dimension right. of, of, of a, an independent country, you know, and independent mm -hmm. people. It, it, it sounds like the economic benefits are outweighing people's desire, or it is that those people of African descent and African people are among the majority wanting independence. However, if they are not, depending on the percentage of the population, they may not have the swing. They may not be able to swing it um, themselves. And if European countries are holding on because of the economic um, possibility and benefits of having extended empire, um, then how, how much have we moved since the period of what we call colonialism, um, which obviously has not died. But Mr. Mr. Busquet, so you're going to give your closing statement in a while after Dobry, but let me hear from Mr. Busquet. Yes, thank you, uh, Professor Shepard. I wanted to um, go to Brother Malcolm because I share what I seem to hear um, from him in terms of the need for us to be careful as to how we assess the level of support for independence. Because if we have to use the yardstick, the normal yardstick of political activities and parties and political statements and demonstrations, then that might not figure out. But if we are to listen um, to people and to watch how they demonstrate their thinking, we will find that in a situation where what I have um, noted here as colonialism, French colonialism being more quote unquote modern and efficient re results in a situation where you still have St. Lucians, for example, saying um, they wish 
we have been colonized by the French because the French take better care of their people. But Brother Malcolm displayed a paper, and I want him to go back to it because I seem to have heard him inviting us to ask him to explain what does independence look like. And if we could have that photograph um, back up with the three girls, that, um, that outfit is one which transcends across the French colonies, as well as in Dominica and St. Lucia, that were French colonies as a real manifestation, what we call Julie Creole. It is actually Indian Madras fabric, but because of historical reasons, it is the common expression of that resistance. And I would like to hear Brother Malcolm's um, reason for highlighting that particular photograph. Okay. Well, um, Why the photograph? Uh, All right, there you go. What does independence look like? What was your purpose of visualizing that question like this? Well, in, in preparing for, for this, I had come across Baba and in terms of mimicry. And I looked at this and thinking then that this would be a sign of cultural resistance because mm -hmm. you know, this is encapsulated in, in St. Lucia and Dominica who experienced it. But you still, for example, you look at pictures of uh, Martinique and Guadeloupe, I noticed that you'd still see this fabric and, and, and the head ties. And, no, and in reflecting on that, I was like, well, this does not seem then that everybody is very much in agreement with assimilating because this stands as to reason as a clear sign of cultural resistance to this whole matter of the French assimilation, because this would be a, a retention of some sorts of their own, or move rather towards an, an, an identity that is geared toward themselves, separate from that of French. Okay. All right. So it's time now for us to, to close. And I'm going to ask each of you to, to, um, to give a closing one minute. And then Earl will will give the vote of thanks. Dorbin? Yeah, I I am I am one of the advocates of, of the, the Nkuma statement, you know, that is better to be free to govern or misgovern yourself than to be governed by anybody else. And so when I look at the whole question of promises, the promises of independence, um, in, 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 the, in the Caribbean, I think in many ways that the promises were unreal. Um, and I'm back in the 19, where we, 1961, 1962 era, that the promises might have been unreal because not enough consideration would have been given at that point in time to the reality of the results of enslavement and colonialism. The unpreparedness of our countries with, with, with high illiteracy rates, poor healthcare, et cetera, to make way in a world that was essentially opposed to, 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 to the well-being of African people. And so for me, I, I, I don't worry too much about this whole question of promises or unfulfilled promises. And likewise, I, I tend to focus on benefits. Where the pitfalls are, are not pitfalls around independence, but pitfalls around the leadership that we have generated within our independent, within our independent states. In other words, if the leadership is poor and they are making mistakes and they are misgoverning, this is not necessarily the fault of independence. This, this is essentially the fault of leadership because mm -hmm. the independence itself is sort of defined, designed within constitutions, fairly well established as to what independence means in terms of its freedoms and its rights, et cetera, et cetera. And so mm -hmm. I, am, I am very, very, I should say happy, quite well moved, by what is happening as far as independence is concerned within okay. 60 years, where our countries have reached, what they have managed to do and to achieve in that period. And if, but if you, I'm pushing a little bit, if you think about what Zondar said about a golden handshake, 
had we got well it didn't seem to have worked too much for them anyway because most of it went back to france to um to the netherlands but um we are still fighting for that golden handshake because that for the caricom region that was not forthcoming yeah. do you think it would have made a difference and um will it make a difference now yeah, it certainly would have made a difference and it will make a difference now. But uh, I think we can ignore the whole concept of golden handshakes and, and simply press our case for reparations. Yes. Um, mm. and to be inclusive of that supposed golden handshake that, that yes. we should have reached at, 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 in, at, 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 at independence. And okay. I think also that the, in, in, in light of the, 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 my, my focus on colonies, that those colonies now moving to independence must not make the mistakes that we made in terms of not insisting on golden handshakes or following models, for example, the model of Dominica, the Commonwealth of Dominica, that became that 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 became a republic on independence, negotiated as part of their in of, of, of their independence package. That these are some examples, I think, that the colonies can look at at this point in time. That's a good point. Mr. Malcolm, your closing minute. Um, well, one of the things I'd want to say is just that the, the looking at the French Antilles is a, is a rather complex um, situation. And the fact that the, this whole matter of sameness and though you're integrated does not necessarily mean that you're the same. And especially one considers the, the geographical issues surrounding the, the French Antilles and the, the, and the separation from France. And then also the legacy of colonial um, history that France would have left on these particular spaces. And you're seeing where that, you know, you can say that all is not necessarily well, you know, you have, you've had riots, you've had, independence movements, you know, for example, in French Guiana, you know, bubbling as recent as I can think of 2017. And, you know, looking at the policy of assimilation and really and truly, is it working? Has it worked? Um, how much of a Frenchman or a French woman are you when upon leaving the Caribbean going to France? And although, yes, you might have economic and political um, benefits, but that identity, the sense of self, you know, where does that rank and how is it that we, we what possibly will be the next step for the French Antilles? Mm -hmm. All right, thank you both so much for your presentations and interventions and feeling of questions. I'm going to ask Mr. Bousquet to just close us out. I won't come back in, just to ask you to give your vote of thanks and to close us out today. Thank you, everyone. And uh, thank you, uh, Professor Shepard. We want to uh, thank all of our participants in this uh, very valuable discussion, which I'm sure our students um, will have learned quite a lot from, which will have been shared also by teachers and principals uh, everywhere, as well as the wider and growing community of uh, persons across the Caribbean in the diaspora, and everywhere else who follow uh, our lectures that have gone quite some way uh, in the nine months up to today uh, that we have hosted uh, nine respective uh, sessions. And as uh, Professor Shepard said, in July, we will be inviting uh, all previous presenters um, to our special uh, session. And uh, we look forward to uh, that quite a lot. Um, today would not have been possible had it not been for uh, our fellow stakeholders in the National uh, Reparations Committee in St. Lucia, in particular the uh, UE Open Campus in St. Lucia, the St. Lucia Nobel Laureates Festival Committee, the Sir Arthur Lewis Community College, and uh, our several other member entities, the latest stakeholder being uh, Calabash TV, uh, Channel 110 on flow, as well as our enablers and our cooperators, cooperants uh, in Jamaica at Nationwide Radio, as well, as uh, Talking History, uh, the program that Professor Shepard um, hosts weekly. We want to thank uh, the 
Center for Reparations Research Special Task Force that coordinates uh, these uh, lectures that are always smooth and uh, near, if not always uh, complete and successful. Uh, but the, this committee, um, including Dr. Uh, Mr. John Shorter, Dr. Sandra Gift, and uh, many others, work throughout uh, the month alongside others like Mr. Nkuma Lucian in St. Lucia and others to ensure uh, that the topics while previously selected are presented in ways like today that go beyond the traditional textbook approach. Uh, we would not have been able to have gone as far as we have today without the contribution of the UE Open Campus dot edu uh, youtube and uh, facebook links through which most of you are with us today and join us every week and uh, last but by no means least our uh, presenters mr zunda who had to uh, leave us uh, for his meeting with the uh, vice president uh, uh, joe breen who always delivers uh, as expected when requested and of course, it was a fine getting to know Brother Malcolm out of uh, Jamaica. And I do commend uh, the uh, recommendation um, from Professor Shepard and which he warmly received uh, that we have those sort of comparative exchanges with students in English speaking territories and, and, and nations within CARICOM so that they could get first the picture of the non-English speaking territories and then ask to make um, a comparison. So all in all, on behalf of um, all of us, thanks to all of you. And until our next lecture on the fourth Thursday of July, I'm Earl Buske on behalf of Professor Shepard and our team saying thanks for being with us and join us again next month. Yes, I did say I wasn't coming back in, but I really <laughs> I have to I have to come in to, to say that we really we, we really want more students and teachers to tune in for the July ending lecture. As you say, the fourth Thursday. Mr. Malcolm, I'm gonna ask you to help us to mobilize students and teachers, because this is a, an opportunity. They are going to have on Zoom, on YouTube, on Facebook, all the lecturers who spoke since September last year to today. And it will be an opportunity to, to look at their syllabus and ask questions because everything in the syllabus was covered since September to now. And we'll all be here and, and um, the numbers have been disappointing, um, I have to say, in terms of those who are tuned in. We have to find a way because people say, oh, academics don't help, you know, the teachers um, just teach and they go. We have mobilized experts to help the, the students. So the reason the students have not shown up in their numbers, we have to find out why, and we have to work together to ensure that we have the parents helping us, the teachers helping us, the teachers associations, all of our networks so that in July, we'll have a packed house. So that's my appeal uh, for today, but thank you ever so much to everyone who showed up today. Thank you.